Good morning, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a great honor and great pleasure, pleasure for me to introduce shortly this meeting. First of all, I would like to welcome our special guest, our main speaker, Professor Van Proyen from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to be part of this meeting and for to visit Slovakia for a few days. Uh, also, I would like to thank the presidency of Slovak Academy of Science, now here represented by the Vice President Zuzana Pancova. Thank you for enabling this meeting through providing mobility visit grant. Uh, I am very happy that today we can listen, we have the opportunity to listen the lecture on the topic of conspiracy, political extremism, political radicalism, because it's very important and very serious issues these days all over the world, but especially in Slovakia, uh, as we know from multinational uh, comparison that Slovakia is a country with very high level of uh, conspiracy beliefs, especially in comparison with other European countries. And also, we have a parliamentary election in a few days, so we were able to observe uh, the, in this pre-election time uh, different parties using uh, some uh, radical proclamations, uh, slogans and so on. We, we were also able to observe what are the consequences, negative consequences of such use for the society. We as a social scientists have an obligation to provide society with the knowledge, input into the things, and I believe that uh, this meeting will help this goal. I also very happy for following presentation from the uh, researchers from different institutes of Slovak Academy of Sciences because it can provide some local view, some interdisciplinary view, maybe the view from different theoretical positions, different results. So I believe this meeting can be a space for some interchange of knowledge and results. Uh, uh, before I pass or give the uh, place or floor to my colleague Jakub Schroll, who will introduce Professor Van Proinen in more details, I would like to thank you for coming here today, not only those of you who are present here in person, but also to those of you who are listening or watching us through the online broadcasting. I wish you all a very successful conference fruitful and fruitful discussion. Uh, and thank you very much. And Jakub, please take the floor. Thank you, Peter. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed colleagues and guests, uh, it's both honor and privilege uh, to introduce our honored guest today, uh, Professor Jan Willem van Pruyen. Uh, Professor van Pruyen is a highly accomplished behavioral scientist who currently holds positions in psychology and criminology uh, at some of the most prestigious institutions in Netherlands. That is including the VA Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands Institute for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement, and the Department of Criminal Law at the Criminology and Criminology at Maastricht University. Uh, Jan Willem's research focuses on the complex and often intriguing facets of human behavior within the realms of politics, law, and society. And uh, his work can be broadly categorized into three main thematic pillars. pillars. Those are conspiracy theories, uh, unethical behavior, and radical ideologies. Uh, his extensive, extensive body of research has been published in renowned journals, and he also authored several influential books, such as The Psychology of Conspiracy Theories. Um, his dedication to advancing our understanding of these critical topics uh, has earned him numerous accolades, including, but certainly not limited to, this invitation visit at the Slovak Academy of Sciences. And beyond his academic achievements, um, Jan Willem is uh, also sought after expert in the media, providing valuable insights on his areas of expertise. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Jan Willem van Proyen. being here. Thank you, Jakob, for this wonderful introduction, and also Vladimir and Jakob for uh, hosting me this week. They've been uh, excellent hosts so far, and uh, also introduced me to uh, some of the prettiest uh, areas of uh, Bratislava in the past uh, few days. Um, so, as Jakob just mentioned, I've got three uh, thematic pillars in my research, and two of them are conspiracy theories and extremism, and a lot of uh, my research is actually also focused on integrating the two, because uh, extremism and, um, and, and, and conspiracy theories have a lot in common and are rooted in a, a lot of uh, the similar, lot of similar processes. So 
A little something about conspiracy theories. Uh, I think everyone in this room has no doubt been across many different conspiracy theories. Uh, lately, of course, during the pandemic, there were all sorts of conspiracy theories that, you know, the virus was created in the lab or that uh, Corona was a hoax and that, that it didn't exist. Uh, there's also, were also, of course, conspiracy theories earlier on uh, after the 9-11 terrorist strikes. There were many conspiracy theories that it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, an inside job by the U.S. government. There's conspiracy theories about climate change, economic crisis, the war in Ukraine. There's also various conspiracy theories about that. And yeah, you really have seen in the past few years that these um, conspiracy theories have become increasingly salient, I would say, on social media and, uh, and the Internet. Now, as a scientist, as scientists, uh, yeah, this, uh, we also have all, uh, you know, we also have picked up on, uh, on conspiracy theories and increasingly we are, uh, yeah, scientists are recognizing the importance of, uh, of this, uh, this topic. Um, that also, yeah, um, warrants a scientific definition. So uh, the definition of conspiracy theories as we investigate them in our lab is explanatory beliefs involving multiple actors who join together in secret agreement to pursue hidden goals that are widely seen as malevolent. So there's a couple of key elements here. There's, it's always a group. There's always multiple actors. You can't conspire on your own. Conspirare, the original Latin word actually means to breathe together. So it's, it's, it's about stuff you do together. It's in secret. Uh, if it gets exposed, conspiracies exist, right? Uh, Watergate was real, but that's not a conspiracy theory. That's just a conspiracy. It's not a theory. It actually happens. Um, and it's malevolent. So the way we study it, it's always about conspiracy theories that wants to do stuff that we find criminal or evil or immoral. You actually can also conspire for good, huh? uh, like uh, holding a surprise party for your colleagues. It's a, a positive conspiracy, but that's not exactly how we study it. That would actually also be a pretty interesting uh, research topic. I actually have one unpublished data set in which we actually looked at that. And the people who are more likely to believe in these positive conspiracies are also more likely to believe in negative conspiracies, actually. But that's a bit of a different story. Um, Often they are powerful and legitimate institutions that are implicated in conspiracy theories, like uh, the United States government, of course, or any government. I, I would guess also the Slovakian government, is that right? So, yes, Vladimir is already uh, nodding her head. Uh, of course, uh, government corporates, uh, think of oil companies who elicit wars in the Middle East, pharmaceutical industry, uh, who, you know, who has created the coronavirus, for instance. Um, but there's also a lot of conspiracy theories about, um, you know, for instance, minority groups. Think of uh, Muslims or Jewish people. Um, there have been anti-Semitic conspiracy theories throughout the ages, and that actually led to mass persecution of uh, Jewish people in medieval times. Think of uh, during the bubonic plague uh, conspiracy that there were uh, lots of conspiracy theories that uh, the plague was caused by Jewish people who had poisoned the water wells. And for instance, in a city like Straatsburg, uh, almost all Jewish people got murdered because of those uh, conspiracy theories. Um, I started studying this topic in 2008. And uh, back at the time, I had a lot of trouble uh, persuading my colleagues of uh, the relevance of this uh, uh, a phenomenon, uh, you know, uh, a common criticism that I got was, you know, is this your social psychologist? Isn't this something for clinical psychology? And isn't this something that you can actually see only among a few individuals who need treatment? And uh, well, actually, <laughs> that's not entirely true. And I think that has also now become very apparent already in 2016, when we could see that uh, conspiracy theories like Trump could actually get elected U.S. president and also during COVID. Uh, these are all nationally representative samples drawn in uh, 2020. COVID-19 was planned. That was the question in the United States. 25% uh, agreed to that. It was purposefully created in the lab. 26% uh, of Canadians agreed to that. 39% of Australians uh, uh, agreed to that. That's not something you can just explain away through pathology. That suggests that this is something um, more basic, something that many people are susceptible to. Maybe all of us are susceptible to it to some extent, I would say. I think all of us at some point have suspected in the organizations where we work that the higher management wasn't being completely transparent about things. And it's not always nonsense, you know. Sometimes conspiracies actually do happen. 
Now, um, today I'm going to focus on uh, conspiracy theories and extremism. And I uh, said, I, I think it's very extrinsic, intrinsically related. And I very, I actually was inspired by a quote by Maximilien de Robespierre. He was an extremist during the French Revolution. Uh, he was the leading force, leading to many people being uh, uh, put to death under the guillotine until um, the irony had it, uh, or I don't know, uh, karma had it that he himself also ended underneath the guillotine. But in any case, he was an extremist and this is what he said to justify uh, all the uh, assassinations. Uh, there are only two parties in France, the people and its enemies. We must exterminate those, those miserable villains who are eternally conspiring against the rights of man. We must exterminate all our enemies. So, and I think this really portrays very well how an extremist sees the world. It's very binary. There's good and evil. We are the good ones. And people who think differently than, than, than us are evil. Hey, you're with us or you're against us. That's typically something an extremist uh, would say. And if you're against us, you're apparently conspiring. And I think this, this is some, uh, yeah, here you can actually see, yeah, the role of conspiracy theories creeping out in this extremist uh, uh, worldview. Now, Maximilien de Robespierre um, isn't alive anymore for a couple of hundred years, but also present day extremists seem clearly uh, driven by conspiracy theories. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Anders Breivik, uh, the perpetrator of the uh, shootings in, uh, in Norway, in Oslo, and the bombing in Oslo, and the shooting in, at, at Utøya. He published a manifest of over 1500 pages on the internet before uh, committing his terrorist strike, and it was full of Eurabia conspiracy theories. So that's the allegation that there's a conspiracy of uh, left-wing politicians and Arabic leaders to Islamize Europe and make it, uh, yeah, and, and, and replace the, uh, the white European population with, with Muslims. That's actually a more specific variant of the so-called Great Replacement Theory. This is a very common, very popular theory in far-right circles. Brenton Tarrant uh, uh, was clearly driven by this Great Replacement Theory. He also published a many, he was the shooter of the Christchurch shootings uh, in New Zealand for the record. And he also published a manifesto on his website before uh, doing it. He was, uh, by the way, inspired by Breivik. And then the title of that manifesto was The Great Replacement. And, uh, and he um, when, you know, eventually admitted to his actions. And when asked what he wanted to accomplish, his answer was, I wanted just to kill as many Muslims as possible. So, uh, yeah, also present-day extremists seem uh, driven. There's also been uh, a qualitative study recently uh, that compare non-violent with violent extremist groups. There's this idea that many people have that violent groups necessarily are extremists. Uh, are, sorry, that extremist groups are necessarily violent. Sorry, I think that's, just, uh, um, that's not true. Actually, even for extremist groups, the step towards using violence is a big one. But the extremist group that tend to use violence, you actually can see more evidence of conspiracy theories in their rhetoric than uh, extremist groups that aren't violent. So it seems to be really a driver. A good way to put this is, is not all conspiracy theories are extremists, but most violent extremists are conspiracy theorists. Um, this is a, a very well-known and frequently cited study by Bartlett and Miller, who actually, this was a qualitative study, who um, looked at the rhetoric and speeches and documentation of underground extremist groups that violated the law of all sorts of different ideological orientations, radical left-wing groups such as the Rote Armee Faction in the 70s and up until the 90s, I think, and uh, responsible for bank robberies and mil more than 30 murders. Uh, Far-right groups such as neo-Nazis, uh, uh, religious fundamentalist groups such as Al-Qaeda and Hamas, uh, and also other groups such as anti-technology groups, also cults uh, were in the sample. And uh, they looked at the extent to which conspiracy theories were part of their rhetoric. And what they actually found was that in many of these groups, not all of them, but in many of them, you actually found pretty strong evidence for conspiracy theories being a pretty central part of uh, their uh, belief system. Some ideas actually occurred in pretty much, yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much independent of ideology, such as anti-elitist sentiments. And all these extremist groups, um, you know, uh, resist against the established order, are very suspicious of the government, for instance. So what these authors, this is the citation partner Miller, uh, have noted is that conspiracy theories may serve as a radicalization multiplier. So conspiracy theories exacerbate the dynamics underlying extremism and thereby accelerating the process of radicalization. So it's not the 
lead cause of extremism. I think extremism is more complicated. There's a lot of factors like deprivation, peer pressure, economic circumstances, a lot of different factors that all contribute to the process of radicalization, but conspiracy theories are part of it and accelerate uh, the process of radicalization. I think that's the good way to put it. And according to Bartlett and Miller, there's three more specific processes. So conspiracy theories demonize outsiders. Yeah? So it creates this black and white us versus them narrative that the Robespierre also mentioned. They, the evil ones, and we, the good ones, whoever responsibility a moral obligation to fight them um, conspiracy theories also enable extremist groups to discredit criticism of the group all extremist groups get criticism such as through the media and therefore extremist groups typically are very conspiratorial towards the media far-right groups often uh, portray uh, the media as a jewish conspiracy there's a lot of anti-semitic conspiracy theories at the far right not surprisingly but that's a way to discredit criticism of the group in this case and uh, so, and this is where the a link with violence committed ex can give extremist groups the feeling that violence is the only remaining option. If you believe that there's this conspiracy that is about to cause the, I don't know, the apocalypse, and, and, and it can give people the feeling that they need to actually use violence to fight it, it can also enable them to justify the killing of people who are innocent. That's a necessary collateral, collateral damage to stop the conspiracy. Now, um, of course, Bartlett and, and Miller, that's just one perspective. Um, I would actually be more inclined to also look at the broader literature of conspiracy theories and extremism. And I've had a look at what they actually have in common. And what is striking is that both, uh, what both have in common is that they, you know, you know, extremist and polarization and also conspiracy theories tend to go up when people feel, feel scared, like in social societal crisis situations. Eh? During the pandemic, there were was a lot of polarization, like think of the anti-vaccination or anti-lockdown movements with uh, who were violently protesting. So that really elicits extremism and also conspiracy theories. And the driving emotions of that are feelings of anxiety, uncontrollability and uncertainty. Um, now let's have a look at uh, how that uh, works more specifically. Um, so like I said, it's uh, driven by crisis situations. Now we have, of course, had a lot of them recently. Uh, uh, we had uh, the corona pandemic eliciting a lot of conspiracy theories and then when that ended uh, yeah, the war in ukraine started interesting anecdote is that in the netherlands um, there were a couple of these public figures full of conspiracy theories about the corona uh, pandemic and then the war in ukraine started and uh, yeah and then uh, th those were the same people who uh, for instance believed that you know uh, the media framed putin to make putin look like the bad guy and um, and I was asked by the media uh, whether I thought it was a coincidence, whether these were the same people. And of course, the answer is no, this is not, <laughs> this is absolutely not a coincidence. Uh, these are, uh, you know, the best predictor of believing in one conspiracy theory is believing in a different conspiracy theory. And these people apparently have a habit of, may, of responding to crisis situations by, by, by blaming it on conspiracies. Now, this is a more specific model that, we pub that I published in 2020. Uh, to explain the link between the stress and conspiracy theories. Uh, so uh, the idea is that existential threat, which is a really, actually a really broad term to, um, uh, to, to, to you know, uh, include feelings of anxiety as, as, as caused by crisis situations, lead people to a desire to make sense of that, which can lead to conspiracy theories. But not necessarily. Yeah? Some people don't respond with conspiracy theories to crisis situations. Some people find meaning in other ways. They start supporting the government more or they start uh, praying or become spiritual. Um, the idea is that uh, people uh, start believing in conspiracy theories when there's an antagonistic outgroup, a group that they distrust, uh, that they can scapegoat and that they can blame then uh, a conspiracy uh, uh, theories emerge. So the need to make this a, a sense of distressing events of feelings often implies scapegoating, scapegoating of groups that did, one didn't trust to begin with. And these can be any group that people distrust, like high power groups, such as the government or companies, but uh, also scientists. General public think that scientists are really powerful, but actually we're not really. <laughs> we just analyze data and publish papers, but never mind. Uh, and uh, yeah, and of course minority groups, so a relatively more vulnerable group. Now compare this with the literature on extremism, and you actually see that in different terminology and with different terms and different words, they actually have pretty much the same uh, idea. So this is, according to Kruglansky, significance loss is a key driver of extremism. So the, he defines that as feelings of distress, humiliation, injustice, exclusion. 
So I had would label that existential threat, but I, I, I see it's, it's, it's well, pretty close, I would say. And um, according to uh, Kroplansky, these extreme beliefs and action help people to restore a sense of significance, a sense that they matter, a sense that they are deserving of respect, and they do that by fighting or opposing a group that they perceive to be hostile and dangerous to, to the common interest. So it's not entirely the same, I would say, but there's a lot of overlap in these uh, different uh, uh, theories. So I would say that uh, conspiracy theories and extremism are rooted in relatively comparable processes. Now, what I would like to focus my presentation on uh, today is the question how conspiracy theories facilitate radicalization through four more specific angles. First of all, uh, conspiracy theories uh, decrease, and I'm going to sort of assume an, a causal link of conspiracy theories to radicalization, but you know, of course, it's probably more likely bidirectional, but okay. But uh, conspiracy theories predicts the decreased adherence to rules and reg regulations. When people believe conspiracy theories, they feel like they can act above the law, and you know, that's also can a, 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 a characteristic of, 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 of you know radicalized groups that they feel that the law doesn't apply to them. Um, some evidence is, for instance. Uh, published by Daniel Jolly, he found that uh, conspiracy thinking predicts small forms of criminal behavior, like filing false insurance claims. Why is that the case? Well, actually, that's very simple. If those up there, uh, if you believe those up there, the powerful ones, constantly break the law and constantly, you know, uh, fill their own pockets uh, through illegal means, why can't I then benefit of a little bit, bit of dishonesty, right? They're doing it too. So that's uh, uh, decreased adherence to rules and regulations. Uh, deteriorated interpersonal uh, uh, relationships, so uh, the distrust in others and also rejection experiences. So what I'll show you uh, later in this presentation is that conspiracy theories predicts rejection experiences, so there are problematic, more problematic interpersonal relations. And that's also a driver of extremism, actually. Uh, people who are uh, radicalized tend to get isolated from their more moderate social support network and therefore also more integrated in, into radical groups that are like-minded and that uh, also think uh, in, extreme, in an extreme manner. <clears throat> uh, conflict between groups in society that's heavily associated with conspiracy theories. That a conspiracy theory actually really is a belief that a hostile outgroup is you know, uh, threatening or harming your in-group, and uh, yeah, and in an extremist mindset, think again of the quote by Robespierre, uh, that's also really about uh, they are evil and we are the good ones and we need to fight them. That, that's really this extremist mindset. So we're going to look at some data on conflict between groups in society. And finally, political and ideological polarization. So uh, general opinions, uh, political beliefs, they tend to get uh, more extreme, uh, both in relation to conspiracy theories, and that's also a natural aspect of, of, of radicalization, I would say. But let's um, start with a decreased adherence to rules and regulations. So I actually don't know if this also happened in Slovakia, but uh, a lot of the, the, in the Netherlands, in the UK and France, in the Netherlands, more than 25 of these telecommunication masts were put to fire in March 2020 um, and the police has noted that this was done by activist groups who think that, uh, uh, yeah, that the pandemic was caused by a 5G radiation. That was a common conspiracy theory in March 2020. The famous Hollywood actor Woody Harrelson also believed that, uh, by the way. Here you see 5G being uh, written down here, uh, which was uh, a problem, you know, in a pandemic, in these communication masks are used for all sorts of uh, telecommunication. So it could happen uh, after an arson attack that uh, people couldn't use the mobile phone anymore for a while, which is sort of a problem in during a pandemic when you may need to call the, 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 the ambulance uh, on a short notice. So yeah, uh, here you see that these pe people felt entitled to violate a property that wasn't theirs because of their conspiracy beliefs. Um, I have a PhD student, an external PhD student working at the police, and uh, she has access to data that I otherwise wouldn't have access to. So uh, uh, police transcripts of um, um, uh, suspects of crime uh, who are being interrogated. And her key research question is, you know, uh, to what extent do conspiracy theories, can conspiracy theories play a role in um, uh, committing crime? 
Now, when we started off, you know, of course, one of the interesting part was what conspiratorial network or conspiratorial framework would be, would we be most likely to see back, right? And first we all thought, oh, that's QAnon, right? I mean, they send hate mail to, uh, to uh, public figures. They sometimes throw stones at the police. And sure, we found QAnon cases in there, but that wasn't the main thing. The main thing was actually the sovereign citizen movement. I don't know if you have heard of that, but that's um, a movement that started in the US and is now also increasing in size, at least in the Netherlands, but I think in many uh, European countries. These are citizens who believe that by signing a few contracts online, you can declare yourself autonomous or sovereign from the state. And after you do that, they're actually being ripped off. You need to pay hundreds and hundreds of euros <laughs> to do that. Uh, but it, once you do that, actually they believe that the law doesn't apply to them anymore. They, they, they sort of declare themselves stateless and so they don't recognize the law anymore. And that makes them feel entitled to break the law in any way possible. Think of, uh, you know, they're not paying the pills anymore. Uh, they don't pay, pay their rent or mortgage, they print their own fake passports uh, and driver's licenses from the internet and when held by police they show it, like an, an, an also the contract, I'm a sovereign citizen, so this is okay. Um, they, oh sorry, they print their own, uh, this is the diplomat sticker, huh? so and when you're a diplomat you have diplomatic immunity and uh, they print their own version of that of the internet and, and post that on their car so that they can park everywhere without having to pay anything. Uh, not entirely legal, actually. <laughs> and um, which may come as no surprise, they're very often uh, in conflict with the police. And actually, it's surprising that this movement is growing because in the United States, most of them, uh, these people actually sooner or later do end up in prison. Uh, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, the, 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 this movement has gotten a lot of media attention and, uh, and there's actually cases where um, the, uh, the person, where the sovereign citizen, you know, they, they typically then uh, tape uh, uh, it on, on their mobile phone because they think their rights are being violated by this police officer who forces them to, you know, uh, evacuate their house or uh, to uh, go uh, with them to the uh, police agency. And it has happened that they were actually then sending the police officer in question at their home address a um, self-made fine because of violating their natural rights or their allodial rights, I don't even know what that means, but that's the term they use, um, of thousands of euros. There's one case known in, 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 in the Netherlands where a sovereign citizen demanded millions of euros to the police officer for violating their rights as a sovereign citizen. Uh, well, like I said, most of them actually end up in prison. So the, legal system doesn't quite agree to uh, uh, people who think the law doesn't uh, apply to them. So uh, yeah, these are clearly people who operate above the law. Um, during Corona, we've seen a lot of uh, protests. Some of it was uh, fueled by conspiracy theories. Now I need to make a qualification here. Um, you don't need to be a conspiracy theorist to disagree with governmental policy and you don't need to be a conspiracy theorist to, theorist to protest. But there's different ways of protesting. You can protest within the rule of the law, huh? like just peacefully holding a, uh, of, you know, articulating your opinion and then gently say bye to the people who, uh, the police officers who are there to maintain order and then go home. Or you can also start, you know, sending hate mail to public figures or throw stones at, uh, at the police or for demolish pop, uh, property. And that is, the uh, distinction between peaceful and not so peaceful protests, or what Imhoff and colleagues have called uh, normative versus non-normative uh, collective action. And what uh, their research shows is that conspiracy beliefs predict a decreased tendency uh, toward normative action, uh, collective action, so uh, protesting within the confines of the law, and an increased tendency to uh, use non-normative political action. So we, of course, saw that at uh, 6 January uh, with the QAnon adherents who thought that um, uh, the elections were rigged and then they stormed the capital. This is the director of the Dutch health uh, authorities during uh, the corona pandemic. At some point at uh, a, a website there came this conspiratorial narrative that was published by three conspiracy theorists. Um, one of them had um, gained access to one of his repressed memories that he was sexually abused as a child by him and that he also witnessed this guy um, doing all sorts of satanic rituals and drank the blood of other babies. Completely ridiculous of course, but uh, that uh, has led to him needing uh, for months and months uh, 24 hour security because of all the death threats that the security agencies took actually very seriously. 
Um, this is some data that we have. So uh, this was a study that I uh, conducted in collaboration with uh, some political scientists from Kieskompas, which is um, a very big uh, research agency focused on political issues in the Netherlands. Um, so we, it, it was actually a three-way study, but for this study, uh, two waves are uh, relevant. So the first wave was in April 2020, when it all you know, was just getting started, so to speak. We were all in lockdown for the first time. And there we measured uh, conspiracy beliefs, uh, beliefs like uh, was the virus created in the lab. And then in December 2020, we revisited them. There were more than 5,000 participants who uh, filled out the questionnaire again in December, or about 9,000 in April. And uh, in these people, we asked them pretty much what their life was like on a yes versus no binary format. Uh, have you done this? Yes or no? Have you done that? Yes or no? So yeah, I, I love this picture. It's Santa Claus with a uh, face mask. So yeah, it was pretty close before Christmas that we <laughs> drew this, uh, um, uh, this uh, well, it was actually the third wave in uh, three waves, but this other wave. And um, these were uh, the results. I'm now gonna focus mostly on the first part. I'm gonna focus on the, the lower half later in my talk, okay? Um, so, like said, conspiracy beliefs uh, predict decreased adherence to rules and regulations. So there were three rules and regulations that we asked. Did you receive a fine for violating the corona measures? Here you just see a huge confidence interval. That's because we only had two participants in the sample who uh, indicated to have fine. Well, okay, that happens. So not much evidence for that. Um, but did you receive too many visitors in your home than was allowed at the time? Did you visit a party or bar where it was more crowded than allowed at the time? Here you see the dotted line. That means if, if, it's, if the confidence interval is, is at a dotted line, it means there's no effect. But you actually see that uh, in both cases, stronger conspiracy theories in beliefs in April prediction increased likelihood to say yes to that. They also, um, you know, were less likely to follow the health advice of the health authorities. So we also asked them, did you get tested for Corona huh, in, the, in the past few months? And the more strongly people believe conspiracy theories, the less likely they were to get tested. Did that actually have in implications, all of this? We also tested, you know, if they got tested, was it positive or negative? Strong conspiracy beliefs actually also predicted an increased likelihood that the test actually came out positive if they got uh, tested. So yeah, uh, conspiracy beliefs uh, predict violating rules and regulation, and that has consequences for themselves. So when citizens end up in prison, uh, and during Corona, you know, they were more likely to catch uh, COVID. Now, the uh, second uh, pillar of my talk is that conspiracy theories predict deteriorated interpersonal relationships, so it makes people isolated from their more moderate network and uh, which makes them more vulnerable for a more radical group that do agree with them. Um, we know from a lot of previous research that uh, yeah, conspiracy beliefs are associated with traits that people would find uh, you know, um, problematic or yeah, that people you know, don't want to be friends with, with too much. So one of them is self-centeredness. This was one of the things in the Corona pandemic that uh, resonated with me most. I, I don't know if you all said that in Slovakia, but people were fighting over toilet paper in the supermarket. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, well, that, but, but such hoarding behavior is uh, associated with increased conspiracy beliefs. Um, interpersonal paranoia, so uh, conspiracy theories are uh, about groups, eh? so the government uh, you know, harms or deceives citizens, but Interpersonal paranoia is also sort of conspiratorial thinking, but at a personal level, they are uh, plotting to harm me personally. Huh? That, that, that's the essence of paranoia. Now, the more paranoid people are in their interpersonal relations, the more conspiracy beliefs. And there's also uh, some evidence looking at uh, yeah, uh, the link between uh, narcissism, although that link is uh, yeah, not always very uh, reliable, we saw uh, uh, yesterday. But still, um, yeah, uh, if the link is there, it's going to be positive. So stronger uh, narcissism predicts more conspiracy beliefs. And narcissists aren't much fun to have as friends, really. Um, trust in others. So um, there's also some data uh, that conspiracy beliefs predict decreased trusting behaviors to others. So I don't know if you're familiar with the trust game, but that's uh, an economic game where you can earn extra cash if you trust uh, others. Well, and conspiracy beliefs predict decreased trusting behaviors. Now, this is a correlation. Uh, we did uh, actually a study uh, with uh, two, uh, two papers, actually, with uh, Juliana Spadaro, who is an, uh, well, at the time she was a PhD student, but she's now an assistant professor in our department. 
Um, and in that we looked at actually the causal effect of institutional trust on interpersonal trust. And uh, we actually find that um, when people find, uh, so we investigated that with, uh, for instance, uh, also with economic games mostly, but when uh, you have an institution that has behaved untrustworthy on previous occasions that people um, yeah, uh, don't trust, then people also start trusting each other less. Then people start, and that's a causal effect. And this is actually the uh, explanation. We also have mediating evidence of feelings of security. So how am I going to explain that? So um, imagine you want to have your bathroom refurbished. Huh? So and you have an, a contractor and then you sign a contract, right? Uh, and, then, and then you trust that contractor because you have a contract and if that uh, uh, person doesn't hold up their part of the deal you can go to the legal authorities and uh, you know make certain demands and you have a contract so you you know you can you have a uh, strong case then but if you don't trust that legal system right then you also are far less likely to be comfortable in your relationship with that uh, contractor so uh, due, uh, when people um, don't trust in institutions people also don't feel so much protected by those institutions anymore and that makes people less likely to trust strangers and, and to uh, behave in a trusting manner towards strangers. And trust in strangers is really part of the fabric of society. I promised uh, the second part of uh, second half of these data. So do conspiracy beliefs also predict exclusion experiences? So we also found that stronger conspiracy beliefs in April and then um, nine months later, they were more likely to have lost their jobs and more likely to have a reduced income. There's a big alternative explanation here. Maybe those with un insecure jobs in April were more likely to believe conspiracy theories. That's actually pretty likely. But I don't think that can explain these latter two uh, findings. So these were a few experience rejections. So uh, did other people uh, end their friendship with you because of how you think about Corona? And have you... Uh, ended your friendship with others because of how they think about Corona. What we actually find is that a stronger conspiracy beliefs predict a higher likelihood of being rejected and a lower likelihood of actually rejecting uh, others. And this is something that we find also in a lot of other data and others have found that too. Um, people don't like conspiracy theories so much. People, when, you know, when people start talking about, uh, you know, COVID being a hoax and QAnon and so many people are like, ah, you know what, <laughs> I, uh, I have better things to do. So uh, yeah, they're actually uh, likely to uh, this way become isolated and, 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 you know, lose their social support network. This was a paper by Alexander Bohr and colleagues. Uh, this was a cross-national study uh, in which they actually found that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, people have strong uh, negative attitudes and discriminatory attitudes towards the unvaccinated during uh, the pandemic. This is a term global pandemic. You see that all the time. It's actually a, a pleonasm, like white snow. All pa pandemic is inherently global, otherwise it's an endemic. Never mind. Anyway, um, and anyway, but people strongly reject the unvaccinated. While this study <laughs> came out, we had pretty much done, done the same thing only in, in the Netherlands. But I'm going to nevertheless show you what we did. It was a little different, actually. We're still going to try and publish it. But uh, and we looked at polarization between vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. Now, um, unvaccinated people were far more likely to have conspiracy beliefs. So that's just logical. But when we looked at other variables, so dogmatic intolerance. So towards vaccinated people, we asked, you know, um, questions like, uh, should people who are unvaccinated be punished for their opinion, for instance. It's really not being willing to accept the opinions of others. And uh, unvaccinated were asked the same about the vaccinated. We actually find that uh, the vaccinated are less tolerant towards the unvaccinated than vice versa. They're also more angry with the unvaccinated than vice versa. This one surprised us, surprised us actually a little bit, a little bit. They're also a little bit more overconfidence in their knowledge about uh, uh, vaccines. So I'm not entirely sure how to interpret that actually but yeah uh, by and large these were indications that the vaccinated actually were a bit more polarized now and that also of course uh, raises some questions and i'll get to that but first the role of conspiracy theories in this um so among the unvaccinated stronger conspiracy beliefs uh, clearly predicted more polarization towards the uh, vaccinated but actually uh, of interest here is the that the other is also part is also true. So if among people who vaccinated, lower conspiracy beliefs predicted more intolerance and more anger towards the un unvaccinated. So the more people actually pretty much thought that these conspiracy theories were all, well, excuse my language, but bullshit. It's a accepted psychological term nowadays, right? But bullshit. Uh, 
the more likely they were also uh, to uh, reject the unvaccinated and less willing to, uh, um, you know, to, to, uh, to accept them. Now, uh, we also did another question because we also were a little uncomfortable with these findings in light of all the anti violent anti-corona protests. Can we now really conclude that it were the vaccinated who were mo more polarized? Actually, I don't really think so. I think uh, the vaccinated and unvaccinated were both polarized, but in different ways. Um, maybe the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated people polarized towards different groups. So maybe vaccinated people were mostly angry towards unvaccinated people, or maybe unvaccinated people didn't care so much about vaccinated. You know, if you want to get that vaccine, just go right ahead, just, just leave me alone, right? Unvaccinated people were actually probably more likely to be polarized towards the government, who denied them access to restaurants and public places, and, you know, made them feel pressured to get a vaccine that they didn't want to take. So we did another uh, study in which the key dependent value variable was feelings of hate, and we indeed found some evidence uh, for that. So uh, again, vaccinated people hated unvaccinated people more than vice versa, uh, but the unvaccinated uh, uh, people hated the government more than vaccinated, although the ratings were also, well, uh, also the vaccinated weren't, weren't necessarily all too happy with the government, actually. Um, we also asked what was driving support support for excluding unvaccinated people. So this was an analysis among the vaccinated. So from boarding an airplane, entering a rent restaurant, entering indoor public places. So this was a regressing an, an analysis among, among vaccinated people, controlling for a couple of control variables. Um, why do people support that? So this is what people then commonly say. This was the official reason. Huh? We need to protect the health of uh, you know, the elderly and curb the spread of the virus. And, and that's indeed part of it. Uh, but actually, <laughs> feelings of hate towards unvaccinated people actually explained more variance. So why did, didn't... Um, I was also vaccinated, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I, I do it again, no regret. Um, <laughs> why did we vaccinated people uh, didn't want uh, uh, them to uh, enter a restaurant or board an airplane? Uh, to some extent, because we hated them. And that's, I think, uh, in line with the broader message here that uh, people who believe conspiracy theories or express behavioral manifestations such about, uh, uh, about it, like not getting vaccinated, are likely to experience exclusion, are, are likely to lose uh, uh, friends and lose contact with the moderate support network. Um, conflict between uh, uh, groups in society. So uh, we uh, also had a look at, uh, at that. This is a common theory by uh, Joe Shinsky, uh, Vladimir and Jakob, uh, you, you, of course, uh, know, know Joe. Uh, we all were in the conference by, that, that he organized in Miami. And one of his key theories is conspiracy theories are for losers. I uh, once asked him how much hate mail he has received over that and it, he, uh, he stopped counting. But, uh, but he, what, he, what he actually mostly means is that conspiracy theories are for, for instance, election losers or people who are at the losing end in society, like low social economic status. Uh, you can particularly see it in elections, like in well, 2020, of course, we saw it among Republicans. So well, it's a majority thought that the elections were rigged, but also um, in 2016, when Hillary Clinton uh, lost, you also saw uh, conspiracy theories going up among Democrats, um, seeing conspiracies between Trump and Russia and WikiLeaks. So yeah, it is a way, a way to make sense of your marginalized uh, position, particularly when there's another group that is dominant or more powerful. So people have particularly conspiracy theories about groups that are more powerful as a way to make sense of their own uh, marginalized uh, position. So uh, you actually see that among minority groups. Eh? So they're also well, uh, at, uh, yeah, marginalized, I would say, and uh, many minorities uh, face real problems eh? uh, like discrimination. I mean, that's, that's true, that's real, discrimination happens, right? But they are also more likely to endorse uh, pretty irrational conspiracy theories like that, uh, you know, uh, this was a study among African-Americans that, uh, for instance, doctors deliberately give AIDS to black babies to commit genocide, that, that those sort of questions. And uh, these were uh, educated students in uh, the sample and uh, black students uh, agreed more to that than, uh, than white students. Um, Indonesian citizens, they believed conspiracy uh, theories more strongly when the West was described as threatening to Muslims. So this is also, again, this manifestation of, uh, you know, when there's a threatening outgroup, particularly when it's powerful, eh, like and the West is perceived as powerful, then, uh, then that's seen as a, as a threat and uh, instigating conspiracy theories. These were 
conspiracy theories that the West was behind uh, terrorist strikes in Indonesia. Uh, there have been uh, a couple of these terrorist strikes that made it in the Western media, like the Bali bombings, for instance. But there have been over 50 uh, terrorist strikes, actually, and uh, the majority of them didn't make it to the uh, Western media. So this is, uh, you know, at the time was a big uh, theme in Indonesia. Uh, wars, that's the ultimate manifestation of intergroup uh, conflict, are typically accompanied with strong conspiracy theories. That's a uh, conclusion of his, sorry, of his historian. Uh, we now see that, of course, with uh, Putin, who has all sorts of conspiracy theories about Ukraine being Nazis, but in a lot of wars, actually. Uh, this is something that not many people uh, seem aware of. But, for instance, the American Civil War was also heavily inspired by conspiracy theories. That was about slavery. But the decision of the southern state to separate from the north was the belief that the newly elected abolitionist government uh, uh, by Lincoln would annihilate uh, the southern states. Actually, this was pretty explicit in the separation declaration, of, for instance, the state of uh, Georgia. That was also heavily fueled by, uh, by conspiracy theories. And after that, yeah, war uh, apparently in, the, in that era became uh, inevitable. This was a study that we conducted, so uh, we uh, looked, uh, tried to replicate and extend that finding that uh, marginalized minority, minority groups are more likely to believe conspiracy theories. So um, we uh, had a sample of Muslims versus non-Muslims, uh, so we uh, specifically recruited a lot of Muslims for this sample. And we had four types of conspiracy theories. The first two were relevant for a Muslim identity, and so Islamic conspiracy theories. These were questions like, uh, ISIS was created by the United States and Israel to make Islam look bad. That was an example item. And Jewish conspiracy theories, an example item was the Holocaust was heavily exaggerated to justify uh, uh, creating the state of Israel. So now these are, of course, very relevant. And you indeed see that Muslims are more likely to believe that than non-Muslims. Um, but more interesting, and that was the extension of uh, the paper by Crocker, was that we also looked at uh, conspiracy theories that are completely irrelevant for a Muslim identity. You know, we're bankers behind the 2008 uh, economic crisis, and Muslims also believe that more. And other, that was just a bit of an amalgamus of various conspiracy theories, like the moon landings were fake, for instance, and Muslims also believe that more. Um, why was that the case? Was it because of Muslim faith? Actually, no, that had nothing to do with it. We also looked at, uh, 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 you know, ethnic minority status, uh, independent of uh, religiosity, and we actually found pretty much the same thing. The explanatory variable was feelings of deprivation. In other words, feeling that you and your group are being discriminated. And the idea here is that if, I mean, what does discrimination do to a person? It makes, well, mostly feel that the system you live in is unfair and the system is rigged, right? And if the system is rigged against you, it's probably also going to be rigged in a lot of other ways. That's not actually a very far-fetched assumption to make if that's, uh, yeah, if that's, if that's your reality. So yeah, and that's uh, our finding. Um, Donald Trump during COVID-19 was very keen on blaming the pandemic on China. He called it a Chinese virus and also expressed support uh, for the lab. A uh, hundred years ago during the Spanish flu, it was actually very normal to blame other countries. I don't know if any uh, of you know that, but there's three theories where the Spanish flu started, but we know one thing for sure, it didn't start in Spain. It actually arrived very late. <laughs> in Spain, and the reason it is called the Spanish flu is because lots of countries were blaming it, like they called it the French flu, the German flu, the Spanish flu, and somehow Spain lost that battle. <laughs> Completely undeservedly. It was very late in Spain, actually. But, well, uh, Trump uh, apparently still lives in, uh, in terms of uh, his morality and uh, uh, still lives in the 1920s, apparently. <laughs> and he called it the Chinese virus. But the thing is, he wasn't alone. Huh? This is what a, a high-ranked Chinese diplomat uh, said. It might be the US military that brought the coronavirus to Wuhan. That might seem ridiculous, but what we in the West, I work a lot with Chinese PhD students, uh, what we um, underestimate in the West is that the lab theory, that the coronavirus was created in the lab, is actually very popular in China. But in China, the people believe that it was created in uh, the Fort Detrick military lab in Maryland, the United States, and then brought by the military to Wuhan to, you know, uh, for all sorts of nefarious purposes. So uh, this isn't an anomaly. This is a, a very widespread be spread belief, actually, in China. And again, you see that two hostile groups blame uh, a situation, like in this case a pandemic, uh, on each other. Um, well, because I've got a lot of, uh, this was a 
a Chinese master student actually, but I also have a lot of Chinese PhD students. I do a lot of uh, research in China nowadays. Uh, it's actually very easy to do research in uh, China. They also have websites like Prolific and Mechanical Turk. There's one tiny little thing though, you, do, you really do need to speak Chinese. And uh, I, uh, I can only say the word boarding pass in Chinese. My wife works at the airport, but anyway. Um, but this is what we did. This was actually before the pandemic. So this was actually more in the content of the US-China trade war. That war that was still a theme back then. Uh, in the United States, we collected uh, uh, over 200 participants and in China too. And in the United States, we asked the secret agency of China has been trying to influence political decision making in America. This is what we asked in China. And this says the secret agency of America has been trying to influence political decision making in China. So the extent to which these two groups uh, you know, uh, had conspiracy theories about each other. Now, first, uh, main result. This is actually an interesting question for the audience. Who of you thinks think that these uh, conspiracy theories were actually stronger in China? And who of you think they were stronger in the United States? Okay, I think I see a majority for the United States. Um, I completely sympathize with those who say United States. I thought exactly the same, but my Chinese collaborator, Mindy Song, instantly said, oh, no, forget it, forget it. This is way, way, way stronger in China. <laughs> we, everyone in China believes this. And she was actually right. It was, uh, it was actually much higher in China. It wasn't a small effect size, actually. It was more than a one point difference on a seven point scale. And it was, uh, yeah, um, but, and, but that wasn't the interesting part. The interesting part, was uh, yeah, wh where this difference come from. So there were different cultural differences in acceptance of hierarchy in society. Now, what is the important takeaway here is that these are cultural values that put a premium on prioritizing the group above the group interest above the individual interest. And if you prioritize the group interest, then uh, yeah, you're also more likely to believe in the greatness of your own group, so uh, collective narcissism. And you're also more likely to be upset when an, a foreign nation is threatening uh, your country, like Trump was doing in the in the trade war, and this is also what we saw. This is actually Mindy Song. Uh, she uh, she actually uh, yeah did a lot of a uh, lot of credit to her. Actually, she uh, she did unfortunately didn't decide des decided not to pursue a PhD, but I would have hired her in a heartbeat. Um, I think this is a complex model, but the key takeaway is this: so perceived outgroup threat and collective narcissism, so superiority of the in group and the belief that the outgroup is hostile. These are the two key elements of intergroup conflict, of believing uh, uh, that there's a conflict between groups. So why were these what was there this difference between countries? It's because the Chinese uh, yeah, were more likely to experience this whole trade war as a, as a big conflict between, uh, uh, between the two countries, and that fueled these conspiracy uh, theories. So again, conflict uh, between groups fuels conspiracy theories. This was also uh, uh, a study that we conducted during the pandemic. So this was a scenario. So the vaccination campaign had just be begun and we uh, asked, uh, we gave the participants a scenario. These were uh, United States participants. So we told them, um, so uh, imagine the following situations. There's a vaccine, it has been tested, it has been approved. And then half of them read it was created by Chinese scientists and the other half read it was created by United States scientists. And you can take it right now and it will protect you from COVID. You'll be safe, okay? Would you take it? And then uh, actually these United States citizens were far more likely to take it if it was US manufactured than it was Chinese manufactured. And were also less likely uh, when it was US manufactured to believe conspiracy theories like the vaccine has been tampered with. Then when we saw these data, I asked my PhD student Haiyan Wang to translate the materials in Chinese and run the exact same materials in China. And here are the results. The Chinese people actually are far more likely to take the vaccine when it was Chinese manufactured and actually far less likely uh, to believe conspiracy theories about the Chinese vaccine. And this is a scenario study. Did it actually have implications in reality? Actually, yes. And at both sides uh, of uh, the coin, like for instance, in the Netherlands, um, you know, you could enter restaurants and stuff and go to public places if you were vaccinated, but not if you had got the Chinese vaccine, then it, it wouldn't work. Then you wouldn't, you know, get, get this exemption. Reverse, if you wanted to go to China, you needed to be vaccinated, right? Um, but forget about Pfizer or Moderna. They wanted you to be vaccinated with a Chinese vaccine. 
So, and that has led one of my PhD students uh, who wanted to visit his family at the moment when it was possible during the pandemic in 2001. And he had to take four shots of the vaccine <laughs> in the scope of six months, two times Pfizer and two times the Chinese vaccine. I'm all in favor of vaccination, but this was maybe a little bit too much, uh, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, so this actually is a scenario study, but it actually did have implications. We could actually see it back in, in, in real life. Now, the fourth uh, a pillar of this link between extremism and, uh, and conspiracy theories is political polarization. So conspiracy theories are also associated with, uh, you know, more extreme opinions. You clearly see that in populist movements, a uh, vote of the, for in favor of Brexit was heavily predicted by conspiracy theories about uh, Islam, for instance, Islamophobic conspiracy theories. Trump, oh, let's not even go there, I mean, that's the, I don't need to explain, right? Trump's uh, rhetoric was heavily fueled by uh, conspiracy theories. And yeah, we also found uh, yeah, the evidence for that in 13 uh, European uh, countries. So conspiracy beliefs are uh, positively, attitudes, uh, positively correlated with populist attitudes. I must also say the strength of the correlation varies uh, heavily uh, from very weak, uh, 2.07 in Romania, it was still significant, but it was a very big sample. So almost, so yeah, okay. It was slightly there in Romania to very strong uh, in Sweden. It was actually by and large weaker in European, uh, um, in Eastern European countries than, uh, than Western European countries. And we're still struggling a little bit with the explanation. So maybe the audience can help me. But uh, yeah, my explanation would be that um, trust in the government in general tends to be lower in Eastern European countries. So in other words, then it's not, less a necessary requirement to be a populist to believe in conspiracy theories that was the uh, but please do correct me if my if i'm wrong i think you're uh, you're uh, in a perfect uh, position to correct me um in that same study we uh, looked at a broader phenomenon populist gullibility call that's actually a fun finding to share because uh, populists generally uh, proclaim to be critical citizens right are they uh, we actually found that indeed uh, populist attitudes reliably are reliably associated with cons conspiracy beliefs. They also, um, you know, do, do they see news more likely as fake news? Actually, no, the opposite. They're more likely to believe whatever news we give them from mainstream uh, sources and from alternative sources. We also looked at uh, bullshit receptivity. And there's, uh, I yesterday met a scholar who is uh, probably in the audience who uh, does research on the bullshit receptivity sc uh, scale. So that means... That's a scale where um, participants are seen, are, are, are displayed items which were created by a random algorithm, and just selecting randomly selected buzzwords that are thrown in a sentence that is designed to be grammatically correct. But what the sentence actually says is total bullshit. Uh, and then the question to participants is, to what extent do you see this statement as profound? So in other words, to what extent do you see some sort of deeper meaning, a deeper truth in this statement? Hidden meaning, transformed, unparalleled, abstract beauty, good health, impartial reality. <laughs> it was actually inspired by the tweets of Deepak Chopra, actually, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, scale. Uh, the more populist people were, the more likely they saw a deeper meaning in bullshit, actually. And, uh, and they also were also actually also more likely to believe in the paranormal. So are populists, critical citizens, actually know they're more likely to be gullible citizens. So we actually call this paper populist gullibility. Um, uh, polarized attitudes uh, is, uh, you know, uh, associated with the belief that, uh, you know, that you're, you're right. And then you also don't need democracy, right? So, uh, so our conspiracy belief is less democratic. That's a common idea that people have. Uh, is this true? Uh, yes, but with a qualification. So what we find is that conspiracy beliefs predict rejection of the current system of representative uh, democracy or a more stronger tendency to reject the current system of the representative democracy, I should say. But also uh, what we actually also find is that it predicts increased support for direct forms of democracy, such as referenda, because with referenda you can circumvent uh, parliament, right? Now, doesn't this actually imply that maybe they're just as democratic as non-conspiracy beliefs? They just prefer a different form of conspiracy, uh, of, uh, of democracy. Uh, sorry. And um, actually, no, that's not the entire story, because we also find that conspiracy beliefs also predict increased support for autocratic forms of governance. Um, this is a study that, we, uh, that recently appeared in a European Journal. And we actually now have a new paper 
uh, that uh, has tried to look at this in the exact same uh, uh, study. So uh, if in the same data set and the same participants favor both representative democracy and autocracy, depending on their conspiracy beliefs. And we actually find that that's indeed the case. And um, what we actually found was evidence for, for a mediator that's a, a common threat, namely a rejection of the status quo. So in other words, conspiracy beliefs make people perceive anything else as better than the current uh, democratic system, including democratic and undemocratic forms uh, of careful government. The way things are going now is terrible and anything else is better. That's something a conspiracy theorist could easily say. Um, we also uh, did, did some work on conspiracy theories and political polarization. This is um, a study that we published in 2015. These were two out of the four studies that we um, run. These were nationally uh, representative samples in the Netherlands. And you uh, clearly see this U-shape uh, emerging so that the left and the right extremes are more likely to uh, believe conspiracy theories. This um, paper um, raised quite a bit of debate, I must say, <laughs> because uh, some uh, people in some countries replicated it very well, like in Sweden, Germany, Belgium, it uh, replicated very well. Others in other countries, it didn't replicate it at all, uh, like uh, United States, UK, France, there it was just more strongly um, prevalent at the right. Then in 2019, we did another uh, poll actually in the Netherlands. We never got to publish that, but then we actually, that was actually pretty interesting. We still found a U curve, but it wasn't actually a U anymore. It, has it had also in the Netherlands shifted to the right. It was uh, um, well, a, a colleague of mine called it a, a Nike swoosh. I'm, I'm going to draw it in the air. So, so you have here the, the, the left extreme, and then it was like this, and then it went. Uh, so it was uh, at both extremes, but stronger at the right than at the left extreme. So um, at some point, Roland Imhoff um, actually approached me because he was struggling with the same. Is it stronger at uh, both extremes or just at the right? And he approached me and he uh, asked me, you know, well, how about we're going to, uh, you know, uh, address our, our academic network and try to um, investigate this in as many countries as possible? So there was this uh, cost action uh, uh, network that, uh, that uh, yeah, you were also part of. Uh, and uh, we had meetings, there were fellow uh, psychologists and um, yeah, and also um, some other data that we, from Quiche Compost that we got access to. And all together we could run this uh, in, in 26 nations uh, with more than 100,000 participants. Um, this is the effect size for the quadratic term. And uh, yeah, you see uh, quite some differences between countries. What is most important are, are the average effect sizes here. And you see that in two studies. In both studies we find indeed evidence for the quadratic term. The interesting thing was it also that we also found support for the idea that it was stronger at the right. Again, here it wasn't a symmetric U, it was a Nike swoosh, not a, not, not a symmetric uh, U or asymmetric U curve. What was also interesting was that um, uh, there were differences between countries. It's not a given that it's always stronger at the right. There were a couple of countries where it was actually stronger at the left. Uh, an example was Spain. Iceland, I think, from the top of my I thought also Romania, but I'm not entirely sure there. Um, but in more countries, it was actually stronger at the right. It also mattered in what way people were uh, uh, left or right wing. So you can be economically right wing, eh? so that's free market ideology. Uh, that was actually a flat line, so that was completely unrelated with conspiracy thinking. You can also be socially, culturally right wing in terms of rejection of immigrants. That was a very steep linear relationship. The more people believe that, the more they believe uh, 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 in conspiracy theories. I think, so that's really complicated, but there's, I think, one common denominator here. Moderateness, being, being not so extreme, <laughs> actually predicts less conspiracy thinking. So I think, well, there, uh, it's a bit too complicated to just say, uh, you know, it's strong red both extremes. It's actually, uh, there's a bit more to it than that. Uh, the common denominator is if people are relatively moderate, they're less likely to believe conspiracy theories. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I'm a little over time, sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm at my conclusion slide, so that's, uh, I hope that's okay. Conspiracy beliefs are intrinsically related, and conspiracy theories seem to facilitate the process of radicalization. I think this link exists not only because it's grounded in different, in the same the, uh, underlying processes, but also because there's a couple more specific uh, processes that, uh, that, that, that feed into this, such as uh, decreased adherence to rules and regulations. Conspiracy theories make people more likely to violate rules, and that's uh, you know, an aspect of an extremist mindset. 
conspiracy theories make people more isolated from the social support network, which make them more prone to extremist networks. Conflict between groups is heavily associated with conspiracy thinking and also with extremism. And conspiracy beliefs uh, is also uh, associated with more polarized opinions, uh, with more extreme viewpoints. Uh, rejection of democracy is also part of that. And that's the end of my talk. So thank you so much. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, we just have a short time for a couple of questions and then we will have a 15 minute break. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, there was a great talk. Uh, you use uh, word, wording conspiracy theories a lot, obviously, and the whole time I was wondering whether we are making disservice to academic community and science in general by labeling these things as theories. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah. Um... That's a good one, actually. Um, some of the more uh, extreme theories, like you know the, 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 the QAnon theory that there's a blood-sucking elite, uh, you can actually wonder whether that's actually a theory. Uh, it's uh, just a just a very strange idea. Um, the term conspiracy theory definitely has a negative connotation. Um, I uh, did a study. I published a study with Karen Douglas and Robbie Sutton about uh, what does it mean to label something a conspiracy theory. And, you know, previous evidence has shown that if you label something a conspiracy theory, that doesn't matter much if people believe in it or not. But we actually found evidence that the opposite causal order is true. So people use the label conspiracy theory for things that they don't believe. <laughs> um, but that's actually the way it is mostly seen by the general public. I think in science we do have a, uh, you know, a scientific objective definition of it, also one that doesn't exclude the possibility that, that they might be true, right? I mean, uh, it's just, uh, they can be true. Some, some of them are true, but um, yeah, that is the way the public sees it. And I have noticed also a first-hand experience that if you're holding presentations to a general audience or if you say, uh, things in the media about research on conspiracy theories, then there are a lot of people who pick that up um, in a negative way because you use the term conspiracy theory. But there's, yeah, that's, I also don't think there's really another way because this is uh, a phenomenon that, that, that we see in society, that happens in society and that we as scientists should be studying because it has clear uh, yeah, consequences for, for society. So yeah, I do see your point, but I, I also don't really see a way around it, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> sure, that, that could be a way, but I'm not entirely sure whether the general public is going to see that as uh, uh, very different. In a way, conspiracy theories are narratives. Uh, that, that's definitely uh, uh, true. Uh, they are really stories about an evil group of people trying to harm all of us. And often there's also a good group of people, usually the conspiracy theorists themselves, who are fighting that. Um, so, uh, yeah, we actually have some data suggesting that um, uh, conspiracy theories are heavily associated with the belief that there's a secret battle between good and evil that, uh, that many people don't, <laughs> don't see. So, yeah, that's a theme in many movies, right? Uh, that, uh, they are narratives. So, yeah. Okay, we have a time for one more question. Right. Uh, that's a very, uh, a very good question, very interesting question. I actually regularly get the um, um, question also by journalists. Isn't it, isn't it a good thing if, if people are, are, are critical, right? But I think that there's a um, difference between criticizing a politician and critical thinking. <laughs> I think that's not necessarily the same. Criticizing a politician is behavior. It's something that can also be really cheap, right? Just because you hate the person and then, then, then you start criticizing the person regardless of what they say. I think critical thinking 
means an objective analysis of the information given, um, a recognition that your prior intuitions may be wrong. And we actually have a lot of evidence that critical thinking tend to be lower among people high in conspiracy beliefs. So stronger critical thinking tend to predict um, an increased likelihood to be skeptical of conspiracy uh, theories. So keep in mind, this is something a point by uh, Steve Lewandowski, that uh, actual conspiracies occur, but uh, actually no notorious conspiracy theorists are very rarely discover actual conspiracies. <laughs> So, how was Watergate uh, discovered? It was Woodward and Bernstein, right? Uh, uh, um, there was, or, or whistleblowers, like, uh, what, what, what's the name of the guy that's now in hiding in Russia? Well, well it is. actual conspiracies are rarely uh, uncovered by, uh, by, by conspiracy theorists. So, um, yeah, I do think conspiracy theorists give a lot of criticism among, among stuff that they, have, that they see happening, among, uh, the vaccines, uh, scientists, at... Uh, uh, the government, government, government. I don't think that's actually rooted in critical thinking. It's rooted in negative emotions. It's rooted in the confirmation bias. It's uh, uh, rooted in styles of thinking that actually are unlikely to provide uh, a, an actual critical objective analysis of uh, how likely an idea is. So that, that would be my answer to this.